Hello, I'm Saifuddin Amos. Welcome to the Bitcoin Standard Podcast, bringing you seminars from saifuddin.com, my online learning and publishing platform, where you can be the first to read my work and take my online courses on Bitcoin and Austrian economics. Members can read the draft of my next book, The Fiat Standard, in full, and also receive chapters from my forthcoming textbook, Principles of Economics, as they are written. By joining saifuddin.com, you can also join our regular seminars, which you hear on this podcast. Coinbits. Coinbits is a great way to introduce your pre-coiner friends and family to Bitcoin. Get them set up in under a minute and help kickstart their journey by turning everyday spare change into Bitcoin. This Bitcoin-only app takes the uncertainty and fear out of Bitcoin saving by rounding up debit and credit card purchases to the nearest dollar, then using the difference to buy Bitcoin. Set it, forget it, and let the app automatically tax your high-time preference spending by saving the hardest money ever. Want to save in Bitcoin faster? Customers can multiply their roundups up to 10x or adjust their savings frequency for weekly or daily Bitcoin stacking. Coinbits is built on a sound, tried and true dollar cost averaging strategy that turns Bitcoin's volatility in your favor. Once you've gotten a private wallet set up, Coinbits encourages you to withdraw your Bitcoin to your own private wallet and embrace the Bitcoin standard way of life. Start stacking on coinbitsapp.com and save your time and energy in the soundest money ever. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by CoinKite. CoinKite are my favorite makers of Bitcoin hardware. They produce the legendary Open Dime, the first Bitcoin bearer asset, as well as the reliable cold card hardware wallet, the excellent stainless steel seed plates for storing your seed phrases, and the block clock. Now, CoinKite have produced the SATS card, a card the size of a credit card which can store Bitcoin and works great as a gift. CoinKite have just produced a limited edition gorgeous Bitcoin Standard Sats card, which carries the Bitcoin Standard logo, and you can get it from coinkite.shop slash Bitcoin Standard. Use the code Bitcoin Standard to get 5% off your purchase. Get paid in Bitcoin regardless of who you work for and regardless of who is paying you. All thanks to a premium service I personally love and use, and that is Bitwage. Thanks to Bitwage, I receive my books royalties in Bitcoin. It is cheaper, faster, and easier. It is a true set it and forget it system, and Bitwage has been offering this premium service since 2014. Anyone can sign up and use it right away. No restrictions or limits, fully non-custodial. You can even split your incoming payment, get part in Bitcoin and part to a bank account you specify. It could not be easier and I cannot recommend Bitwage highly enough. Go to bitwage.com and sign up now and get paid in Bitcoin with your next payment or salary. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Bitcoin Standard Podcast. Our guest today is Professor Richard Linzen. Professor Linzen is an atmospheric physicist known for his work in the dynamics of the middle atmosphere, atmospheric tides, and ozone photochemistry. He's published more than 200 scientific papers and books on Hadley circulation, monsoon meteorology, planetary atmospheres, hydrodynamic instability, mid-latitude weather, global heat transport, the water cycle, ice ages, and seasonal atmospheric effects. From 1983, Professor Linzen has been the Alfred Sloan Professor of Meteorology at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Professor Linzen joins us today to discuss climate alarmism and his views on why this has become such a major issue and why, as a scientist, he believes that this panic is massively overrated. So, Professor Richard, thank you so much for joining us. Okay, glad to be here. Let's begin by talking a little bit about your background in uh, sciences, um, your career, and how it led you to an interest in climate and the climate debate. So w- tell us more about your background and, uh, and, and your scientific career, really, and how it got you here. Well, it's a fairly long story. <laughs> in many ways, uh, I got into this field by accident. I mean, I was interested in physics. I uh, realized I was more interested in classical physics than modern physics. Fluid dynamics seemed like a good choice. And at the time at Harvard, uh, the people working on fluid dynamics were working on uh, what is called geophysical fluid dynamics, dynamics of the atmosphere, the ocean, and so on. And so I ended up working on that. My thesis uh, was on the interactions of photochemistry, ozone photochemistry, radiative transfer, and dynamics. So that got me into a variety of things. And uh, when I finished, I decided that's what I really enjoyed. 
the atmosphere is full of really good problems and uh, they were fun to solve. And so I, I stuck with that. I've stuck with it uh, since uh, 1960. But, you know, the problems were acute at that time. You know, you had the quasi-biennial oscillation, which uh, was interesting. I mean, above the tropics, around 16 kilometers to about 30, the wind blows from east to west for a year and then turns around, goes from west to east for another year, roughly on the average 60-month, 26-month periodicity. And it's much stronger than the annual cycle or the semi-annual. The question is, what caused that? And that occupied me for quite a while. And uh, I think we found what was considered the solution to that. And then there were old problems. Uh, Lord Kelvin actually uh, pointed to one curiosity with tides that uh, we understood why the ocean tides were lunar semi-diurnal. And then we looked at the tides in the atmosphere and the surface pressure at the ground and they were also semi-diurnal, but solar. But the solar uh, forcing gravitationally is very weak. It's uh, thermal. And the diurnal component is much stronger. Why is it semi-diurnal? And Kelvin suggested maybe the atmosphere was resonant. And that, that carried through the 1950s, 60s, and then people realized that uh, there had to be something else at issue. And they realized that uh, forcing by ozone and so on was very important. It could account for the semi-diurnal. And then my contribution was just to show that the 24-hour component was trapped and couldn't make it to the ground very effectively. So those were fun. We continued working, you know, how does instability work? Why do we have these waves that uh, constitute weather in mid-latitude and so on? Academically, you know, it was a good career. I mean, I started uh, as a postdoc at the University of Washington and the University of Oslo. Then went to work for the National Center for Atmospheric Research. And I decided, watching my colleagues, my contemporaries, that uh, being an assistant professor was bad scene. He got a lot of work and uh, rather uncertain future. So I, you know, tried to wait until I got a tenure offer, and I did from the University of Chicago. Spent about four years there. Came to Harvard for about another 10, 11 years as a professor. And then uh, moved to MIT, where I've been since formally retired since uh, 2013. But, you know, I still have an office and a secretary and occasionally see people. So keep busy, more or less. There were awards and so on. However, uh, you asked about how did I get involved in the climate issue. And in a funny way, that was never separated from the other things I was doing. You know, in 1990 uh, at MIT, no one called themselves a climate scientist. Uh, you know, all of us work in aspects of climate. Indeed, uh, a lot of the books, or some of the books anyway, that dealt with climate were referring to it as the general circulation of the atmosphere. How does it work, period? Forget climate per se. The books that focused on climate focused on different climate regimes in the current Earth. And there are dozens. It's not as though there's a simple climate for the whole Earth. We each worked on our specialty, oceanography, marine geochemistry, meteorology, so on. And all of a sudden, uh, this became a serious issue, quote, politically. And the government showed its hand, so to speak, and said it was all in. Like a lot of things, you know, the march through the institutions, when suddenly found the National Science Foundation was all in on it, the professional societies were all in on it. None of these actually represented, they represented large numbers, but, you know, 
like all such organizations, there's a small group often hired as executive uh, uh, officials, and they speak for the group without uh, sampling it. Suddenly discovered this was an issue, and I felt there was no basis for it. And it's funny, I, I wrote a piece uh, mentioning this, and probably around 1990, sent it to Science Magazine. They said, uh, they rejected it without review, saying uh, that uh, essentially there was no interest in that. I published it then in the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society, and that gave me the first clue that there was a problem. The editor was fired immediately. <laughs> and uh, at any rate, there were a number of people at that time, the early 90s, I would say the bulk of meteorologists objected to this. Mark Mills actually did a survey of people in the American Geophysical Union, American Meteorological Society, and a majority didn't go along with it. But uh, the pressure is built. The funding uh, played a big role, of course. Uh, in 1992, uh, you know, when Clinton Gore were elected, the funding increased substantially, and it was conditioned on accepting this as a problem. Nothing was presented that uh, suggested that it was serious. And indeed, in the first UN reports, and indeed in the last UN report, nobody ever spoke of it as an existential threat. The existential threat issue arose, I would suppose, largely because, you know, for the first 10, 12 years of this issue, it was always said, you know, this will be something we will see in the future. They realized that that had very little sales potential. So they kept cranking up the uh, hysteria uh, until they were telling kids it's an existential threat. You won't live another 12 years and so on. None of this came from the science. I mean, this, so, you know, what are you going to do? Go along? Well, some people did. Most scientists, I would say, did. Yeah. I, you know, it's a tricky issue. Uh, for instance, uh, at MIT now, everyone who has even marginal uh, association with this speaks of themselves as climate scientists. Uh, the work itself often doesn't support it. And a lot of young people just avoid the topic. And if uh, asked, you know, do you go along? It's possible. Yeah, I go along. If you look at what they go along with, it's something like, you know, adding CO2 will give you warming and there'll be some warming. Uh, it's rarely that I think it's an existential threat and we should drop everything and take care of this no matter what the ruination is. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you have this unfortunate mix of uh, politics and science. Uh, Eisenhower warned about this uh, long ago that, you know, eventually grants uh, would be more important than achievement. And, uh, you know, in general, the government has a monopoly on the funding of science, which is okay if the government doesn't have a position. If the government has a position, it's devastating. Yeah, this is, uh, this is a very uh, uh, common theme in my work. I'm an economist and, uh, you know, you might be curious about why is it that uh, people who are interested in Bitcoin are interested in uh, climate. And, uh, you know, most guests I get in here have no, no idea about Bitcoin and no interest in it. But I think it's, uh, it's, it's entirely related because the way that I see it, uh, the current monetary system as we have it, wherein the government essentially gets to create money at will, is at the root of the dysfunction of plenty of scientific fields. Uh, climate is one of them. I believe nutrition is another. I believe economics itself is another. And um, these are the topics that I like to discuss. And the constant theme that is brought up by people like you from uh, many fields is the same idea that you mentioned, which is um, suddenly the there was a point at which the funding uh, came predominantly from government and then you had to go along or go away, basically. You had to, uh, as you said, these bodies become predominantly dominated by bureaucrats rather than the scientists. 
And then they no longer have to follow the scientific method. They no longer have to engage in debate. Their ideas don't have to win on the free marketplace of ideas because their funding is not dependent on being right or being wrong. Their funding is dependent on simply uh, you know, having access to the people who control the money printer. So in a free marketplace of ideas, a university that promotes uh, ideas that don't concord with reality will witness as graduates go out and um, be useless for society and they won't get paid well. And then others won't want to go to that university. And then uh, the graduates won't want to donate to the university. And so the university will be at a disadvantage. But when the funding comes from above, you know, when the funding is essentially astroturf rather than grassroots, then it doesn't matter how insane your conclusions are, uh, as long as you go along with what the people up top, the people who control the money printer, the government bureaucrats, the people who control the money funding, the NIH and the NSF and all of these uh, governing bodies, as long as you go along with their agendas, then um, you don't have to answer to anybody. And so this is, I think, th um, th this is at the heart of this. And so I think it's, it, it's very interesting what you say, that uh, when you started into this field, you know, it was physics and chemistry and meteorology and all these rigorous scientific fields and climate on its own was not really a science. And then um, it, it started to be discussed as a science, as a field on its own when um, government funding came along and when there was this agenda to come up with this conclusion, which is we're in a crisis and it's a disastrous um, existential crisis for humanity. And unless you're taking this crisis seriously, you know, we can't waste research funding on you. Yeah, it's, it's not quite as direct as that, but almost. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, there are plenty of people working on things that potentially are reasonable, improving models and so on. But uh, yeah, you're right. The conclusion has to be that. Uh, lots of people actually were interested in climate. It's not as though it was not a field. It, it is. The reason it was not a field is it was so interdisciplinary that nobody had all the knowledge to deal with it. I mean, my field was dynamics of the atmosphere, mostly. And uh, other people worked on radiative transfer and other people worked on chemistry and so on. And it was very difficult to coordinate them all because uh, nobody had all the information, all the understanding. Uh, if we get into the nitty gritty, I mean, one of the things I mentioned to you and the thing I suggested you read, the whole narrative was pretty bizarre when you considered it. Uh, you know, it was based on a one-dimensional model that could not account for the variety of climates. It ignored the general circulation of the atmosphere where the tropics and the extra tropics have very separate physics and the interaction is pretty subtle. Uh, there were assumptions in it. I mean, one question I'd ask anyone I mean, you know, when you look at these graphs and they're talking about the earth has warmed one degree in a century, and if it's another half degree, it's curtains. And, you know, you look at it and you say, that's a very small temperature. It's, you know, I experience between breakfast and lunch. How is this catastrophic? And uh, part of the answer is a very peculiar one this polar amplification, and although this is very small, it really represents very big changes in some places. And then they say, well, you know, using this metric, uh, ice ages and the Eocene, when you had radically different climate, actually didn't involve more than a few degrees change in this metric. Uh, but, you know the metric was not due to the greenhouse effect. And so they were confusing factors, and that confusion persists through the field. They established a narrative right off the bat, and, and they did something that was very subtle, and it took me a long time to appreciate it. Namely, it is true in modern discourse, establishing the narrative 
is very important. It's a major goal. The question is, how do you do it? And it never occurred to me until recently that you do it by stating the narrative and including lots of dubious elements in it, lots of things that are obviously wrong. Why would you do that? Well, so that whoever is watching it starts attacking these things, but in attacking them, they endorse the narrative. And they don't discuss why the whole thing is absurd. So <laughs> that's where we're stuck with at the moment. And, you know, I find that even with people who are in agreement with me, the thought that they'd have to learn about the dynamics of the atmosphere is a little bit off putting because that's a hard subject. I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but, you know, there's still a big prize out, a million bucks or so, for anyone who can prove that a numerical approximation to the fluid mechanical equations, the Navier-Stokes equations, actually converges to the actual answer. Uh, it's, it's that uncertain in some ways. <laughs> and anyone who's worked in fluid mechanics or in physics of it knows this is a tough subject. I mean, Werner Heisenberg, you know, was saying, you know, this, this is comparably hard to quantum mechanics. And uh, we still don't know quite how things like turbulence work. Yeah. Uh, in my book, The Fiat Standard, I, uh, I make the case that the, the important thing in fiat science is who gets to set the null hypothesis and then how they determine the burden of proof. And this is the thing, like once you, once somebody has the ability to finance the science, then they get to set the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis is that we are in a climate crisis. And then the onus of proof, the burden of proof is on you to try and present all kinds of um, essentially unwinnable, uh, uh, all kinds of evidence to try and win this unwinnable war of convincing somebody of something where their paycheck depends on it, uh, on not believing it. So the burden of proof is just, the deck is stacked against you. you everybody, you know, there's this term, everybody agrees, everybody knows. Um, all the, the scientists agree, the 97%. And then once you, once you start with that, then th th that's it. Like you, they, they've decked the cards against you and there's, uh, it's, it's very difficult to be able to convince them of the alternative. Even in 1988, when there was a Senate hearing on this, Al Gore and Jim Hansen, Newsweek's cover showed the earth on fire and the labeling was all scientists agree. This is before most scientists working in this area even thought about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you get to choose which scientists you include, and then you say, well, all the scientists that matter agree, and then uh, you just define the, the ones that matter are the ones that agree, and then there you go, 100% consensus. I don't, I don't think they bothered to do even that. <laughs> They certainly did later on, you know, the 97% yeah. uh, consensus. Well, yeah, you know, there was a piece in the Wall Street Journal at that time showing the methodology that this guy Cook used to come up with that number, and it was absurd, made no sense, but it didn't matter. Uh, the line was what was quoted all the time. Yeah. And of course, I mean the uh, you know the, the the implication of this has just been now uh, eighty eight is a long time ago, but here we are thirty five years later, thirty four years later. Uh, it, it, it's astounding. The major majority of young children believe they are in uh, not just young children, young adults. Well, young children, I guess, for most adults today, uh, they believe they're in a they're in a crisis. They they believe they have no future. They believe the earth is going to be gone by the time they're old, and uh, it's it's succeeded in really creating this. There's no other word for it: hysteria, where people are just so afraid. Yeah, I you know I wonder about that. I think, quote, ordinary people don't take it terribly seriously. But you're right. By indoctrinating little kids who have no defense mechanism against this, uh, they're making much more progress. 
Polling still shows most people do not rate this high among their concerns. But uh, in the political sphere, they act as though it does. And I think it's even worse in the EU. Uh, You have people, who is it, is making the statement uh, that we own the science without recognizing the peculiarity, as I've often mentioned, that the science is the opposite of science. Yeah, right? this is this is one of my favorite uh, catchphrases. I always use the term "the science" with a trademark uh, sign yeah. next to it because it's like uh, <laughs> it's a trademark set of proprietary information that you're not privy to. <laughs> but yeah, no science by definition is not the science. Uh, yeah. It's a mode of inquiry. Exactly. It's a way of asking questions. It's not a set of conclusions. No. No, it, it's a sad situation. Uh, I, my personal fear is the only thing that will end it is the disastrous consequences of the policies. And uh, Europe is looking at that at the moment. And the U.S. will be too. Maybe when they realize it's just unviable, uh, they'll consider whether it was worth it. Yeah, uh, I think this is the uh, this is the sad reality of it. Uh, but the question then is just how much is it going to take? I think you look at Germany, and you know, already you see the economic impact of their energy uh, crisis. It, it's devastating. But they're getting away with blaming it on the Russian-Ukrainian war, as if that you know, as as if that's the real issue. Which of course it isn't, because the problem is why is Germany so reliant on Russian gas? Yeah, and the reason for that is that they've had fifty years of uh, it's insane to even think of the number but 500 billion dollars of investment in wind energy so it's, it's, it's an insane insane number 500 billion dollars of investment in wind energy that produces zero megawatts on a day in which it's not windy which is insane you could have doubled you could have produced double the capacity of gas plants in germany for that amount of money germany oh, yeah. could have yeah, no, we've seen this before, actually, fairly recently. I, I remember some years ago, I was talking to a group of uh, Republican congressmen, and they entered the room and they said, guess what we've just done? And I said, what? We've banned the incandescent light bulb. Isn't that, wasn't that great? I said, that's the stupidest thing I've heard in a long time. They banned it when the only alternative was the compact fluorescent, which people hated. If they had just forgotten about it and LEDs had come along, uh, you wouldn't have to ban the incandescents. Uh, They would compete in the marketplace and be preferable for many people. Uh, We did the same thing with energy. Even if there were a basis for worrying about uh, fossil fuels, we had no alternative. We had the equivalent of the compact fluorescence, or worse, the windmills and the solar panels. And uh, since that's all we had, we said, that's what we'll use. And uh, you're stuck with something that doesn't work. Yeah, it's it, it's, it's amazing. And um, I mean, eventually, I think the lesson is going to be learned, but it doesn't look like it's going to happen soon. I just saw a couple of days ago, the German, uh, I think it's the Minister of Economy. I'm not sure he's from the Green Party. And he was given a speech in which he was saying, well, it was fossil fuels and nuclear power that got us into this problem. And they're not going to get us out of this problem. And we're going to continue to um, look for the solutions in the sustainable, green, renewable, uh, as have, I like to call them, swings and slides. <laughs> you have to think there's another motivation behind this. One of the problems, of course, is the size of the energy sector. It's immense. It's fundamental. It's foundational. And uh, so anything you do there is going to involve, as you've mentioned already, hundreds of billions and even trillions of dollars, any time there's that sort of action going on, somebody's going to profit immensely, even if it's at the cost of society. So the temptations will be great. I've seen this at organizations 
you know, I won't mention the institution, but uh, it's a conservative uh, free market uh, organization, uh, libertarian, and their donors had a uh, session, very luxurious, very posh. And uh, the donors wanted to know why they were worrying about uh, the climate change issue because they were invested in it. And that organization quickly got out of it. I think I know the organization uh, you're mentioning. And um, we've had similar run-ins with them on uh, monetary issues because it's a very similar kind of dynamic. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I mean, they, they generally talk about monetary alternatives and the need for finding alternatives to the dollar. And now that with Bitcoin, we have an actual working alternative used by millions of people around the world. That has saved people from um, hyperinflation. Uh, my myself, I saved my family by using Bitcoin and getting out of Lebanese hyperinflation. So it is an alternative and it works. And you'd think they'd be all over it, but uh, you know they've got donors who are well into the uh, dollar system, and so um, their uh, main focus has been on poo-pooing the only alternative to the dollar rather than uh, presenting. Uh, well, the, you, you asked an interesting question before. I mean. You know, why are you interested in this and so on? Uh, and it's a question that I asked. Because early in this game, around 1990, uh, a lot of investment firms were inviting people like me uh, to discuss this issue. And uh, I was puzzled as to what they were after. And... I eventually figured out what they were after, which wasn't to find out how the climate behaved. Uh, what they wanted to know, I think, was were the arguments against this issue sufficiently comprehensible by ordinary people who interfere with this issue? They wanted to know where to place their money. And I think they concluded they could place the money on the issue it was, it was not going to be overturned by people understanding the science. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the you know the um, the remarkable bait and switch here is uh, was an, an, another recurring theme in our podcast. Uh, you know the, the the advertising for science over the past couple of centuries was hey let's get out of the dark ages where people used to listen to these priests. And, you know, the, these priests would claim to be speaking to God and then they would tell you what God says and then you had to follow because you're an ignorant peasant. Well, we're going to snap out of that. We're going to enter the Enlightenment. And in the Enlightenment, we're going to replace that with rational thinking. And we're going to do some the scientific method, which is all experimentation. Well, that sounds great. And you go to school, you learn about that and you think, wow, that's so amazing. You know, those evil priests, it's so much better now that we have science and experimentation. And then you, you know, <laughs> if you go along with what you learn in school and university, you think that's how it works. But then if you just dig slightly under the surface or, you know, if you move the curtain a little bit behind, you see that ultimately you're not out there carrying out experimentations. You're not asking scientific questions and concluding the answer. All that you're doing is trusting authority um, to tell you what they did on their science. And this is true in the field of pharmaceuticals. It's true in the field of science, uh, in, uh, biological sciences. It's true in climate science. It's true in economics. It's true in nutrition. It's true in so many fields wherein people have um, just <laughs> gone back full circle to trusting what the priest says about the science. And they think that's the, what the science is. This is not recent. I mean, you know, in the 19th century, America established the civil service. And the idea was that politicians couldn't be trusted. You needed experts. And uh, this was the search for authority. And of course, that is exactly almost the opposite of science. I mean, what happened, I think, is Science was very successful in producing all sorts of interesting things. And so people trusted science. The politicians saw this as science having authority. 
And that's something they desperately wanted. So the, there was an essential need to co-opt science so that the politicians could share its authority and trust. But that was a complete misuse of science. Yeah, and I think the, the bait and switch here is the idea that it was science that produced it. In people's mind, it's the scientific authorities that produced it. So when people yeah. look at increases in living standards and in uh, life expectancy and reduction of diseases, they think you know a bunch of scientific authorities sat down in a lab, conducted experiments, figured out how to think, how how to improve things, and then passed these edicts down to politicians who implemented them. And then we got uh, sewage and engines and uh, all the improvement in the quality of life. But if you actually look at all of the inventions that matter, that really did make our life better, primarily they're about the utilization of energy. Primarily it's engines, the steam engine, the internal combustion engine. And then you look at how these things were invented. They were not invented by uh, authorities of science. They were invented by, in many cases, illiterate and semi-literate workmen in workshops getting their hand dirty oh, working yeah. like the, the my favorite example is the steam engine it was centuries of people tinkering with pumps that turned pumps into engines and then revolutionized the world and then uh, the scientists um tried to co-opt these things and say that they were developing them and then i don't think, i think you're being too cynical about it <laughs> uh, i think scientists were just trying to explain it how yeah, worked. they but they explained it and then they tried to take credit for it. But it was really, um, you know, like the, the the people who were doing the engines were workers. Um, but you know, the Greeks had a steam engine, hero steam engine, and the only application they could think of was to open and close heavy doors. And they decided that slaves were cheaper. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's uh, well, obviously, you know, material science, uh, material engineering, I should say, improved enormously over the past couple of thousand years. And so that allowed the engines to do much more. Um, but I think another another aspect of this uh, is modern medicine basically took a lot of the credit for the improvements that were uh, produced by improving okay. living standards and uh, sanitation. Yeah. Yeah. And then they, they use that to uh, basically sell their drugs and sell their expertise rather than just admit, well, you know, the reason is because the engineers are making sure that you're not drinking uh, your own feces in your water. That's why you're living longer. That doesn't quite sell as well as saying, hey, take this magic pill that we have. Yeah, no, I mean, medicine and medical advances are an interesting area. <laughs> I'm no expert on it, but it's clear public health and certain interventions. I mean, you know, 40, 50 years ago, a heart attack killed you today. They can intervene, put in a stent, do this, so do that. So those are almost mechanical skills. Uh, they weren't based on science. Uh, physiology knew where you had to do this, and engineers figured out how to do it. Yeah, trial and error. And that's that's really the scientific method. I mean, I, I, it's not to denigrate um, uh, these people that when I say that it's not scientific authority. It, that is the scientific method. You know, the guy in the workshop working on a pump and trying to make it better. Yeah, the way they do that is experimentation. You ask a question, what if we do this? What's going to happen? Well, we look, oh, well, it's become more efficient this way. So let's try it again. Let's try more. Let's do more of this. Let's do less of that. Let's take this part out. That's what the scientific method is. But instead, of course, it gets co-opted into uh, institutional science where it stops, where it's, uh, no, no, you don't mess around with the pumps. You don't think, you don't carry out experiments. You just listen to the authorities that tell well, you what's the right thing. As you know, the institutions themselves have changed. I mean, uh, the growth of administrative staff <laughs> at universities is immense. Uh, I once... Some years ago, Chuck Vest was president of MIT. I, I urged him to fire the faculty, that we were only getting the way of the <laughs> interaction of administrators and students. <laughs> Yeah. Now, this is this is a pet peeve of mine. It's uh, I used to be a university professor, and this was uh, one of the main reasons why I decided to leave. And now I teach online in my own university, uh, my own online uh, learning platform. 
I teach many, many more students uh, and I get to influence many more people and I don't have to deal with bureaucrats. And I think it's, uh, it, it's frustrating just how much of the university experience for professors and students is all about jumping through the hoops of people who are not teaching you. They're not out there teaching you physics or math or any of the skills that you're out there to get, um, but they call the shots. Yep. <laughs> What can one say? I mean, it, it is true. I, I occasionally wonder. I mean, you may have better insights than I do. But, you know, the number of young people, children, is decreasing. And so the demand for college education has to be decreasing as well. And uh, how is the system going to contract? doesn't seem to have planned on that in any way. But uh, I think it's inevitable. Yeah, I mean, I guess the way that most universities in the world, uh, in the countries of where um, population growth is slowing down, the way that they're remaining sustainable is by getting in a lot of uh, foreign students. Uh, there's always foreigners that are willing to come in, and that's kind Global of... Global keeping... population is going to be decreasing in a few decades. Yeah, but you can always get foreign students and like you can leverage the prestige. But I think you're absolutely correct that the, it is unsustainable. Yeah. Yeah, and I think um, this is, again, another uh, point that I focus on in my book, which is um, once you, it's true, you find it in schooling, you find it in healthcare, you find it in, um, in universities and in many, many of these fields. Once the financing stops coming from the customers once it's no longer out there competing for customers. And you see that in um, as medicine becomes more government controlled and as universities become more government financed and controlled, then you see always this massive growth in the bureaucrats because the bureaucrats are how you get money. It's no longer out there to compete on the market by providing better schooling, better university degrees, better healthcare. That stuff doesn't get you customers anymore what gets or it does get you customers but it doesn't get you funding what gets you the funding what gets you the big bucks are bureaucrats who know how to um, talk to the other bureaucrats who can give you the funds <laughs> so you look at the modern university you know it, it, tentatively you um, ostensibly you could say they're private institutions but really the vast majority of the modern university funding comes from the government either in the form of research grants which is a major, major contributor to their budget, or in the form of government loans to students. So you need the government to be happy with your university in order for it to give students loans or else students won't come to your university. And you need the government to be happy with your faculty to give them research grants because otherwise they, you wouldn't get that money. Those are the two major sources of financing for uh, universities and they're both reliant on government bureaucrats so you don't win these by going out there and teaching useful things you don't win these by doing actual scientific method stuff you win these by politics by having bureaucrats who know how to secure those grants and how to get more and more uh, financed credit yeah it, it's a curiosity actually colleagues of mine uh, you know who are often supportive of the climate alarm, often complain about the difficulty of getting grants. And uh, I sometimes suspect that uh, although the funding in this area has increased immensely, it probably hasn't kept up with the number of people who jumped into the pond to collect the goodies. And so, uh, the people actually doing science are finding it harder to get funding. Absolutely, this was an, this was kind of uh, one of the. I, I got a PhD from Columbia University in sustainable development, and um, <laughs> this is one thing that I noticed and why I just got alienated from the entire field. I never public. I, I never wrote a research grant in my life because um, <laughs> the way that I saw it is you're not doing anything productive for these research grants in a sense that you're having to conform to an ideology, you're having to conform to conclusions, you're having to take in some, you know, some unquestionable assumptions as a starting point. And, and then now you have to include DEI. <laughs> What's that? 
diversity, equity, and inclusion. Oh yeah, yeah. I left before that stuff became <laughs> a big deal, so I I don't even. Yeah, but like uh, for me as an economist, the way that I think about it is, I'd rather be doing something productive where I get paid from happy customers who say thank you, and that's what I do with my website. You know, I teach courses, people download it. Everybody who's joining us on the seminar today is a member of my website. They pay three hundred dollars a year, and they get to attend all of these seminars and get to take my five online courses, and the vast majority of them are very happy with it. They tell me thank you because, you know, they enjoy it. They learn and they spend like a, a, a less than 1% of what they'd be spending at a, uh, a, at a fiat university, as I like to call them. I'd rather be dealing with customers because in that way, you're producing something of value to others. And then that's, that's something that can scale and that's something that can grow. And the more feedback you get, the better you can uh, make your product and then the more you can grow it. On the other hand, if you're uh, doing the kind of, if you're going after the AstroTurf funding, it's coming from top and there's no limit on how many people can come in and compete with this. So then you're competing in writing better research grants, which nobody's going to read, to then get to write papers to publish in academic journals that nobody's also going to read. And like, even if you become the best at this, the, it, it's not real in any sense. So anybody can copy you and do what you're doing. And it's a, it's it, it's fighting over a, a, a static pie. Even if the pie grows, it's not really growing as much as it would be growing if you were actually baking. Because this is just a pie that's handed from up above, and you're fighting with, for it, rather than actually spending your time baking bigger pies. Well, I'm wondering, as an economist, how you look at something that's often fascinated me. There's a photograph from 1929. Mm -hmm. of a Salve conference, which was a conference of the world's physicists. The interesting thing about that photograph is it you know, has maybe 100 people in the photograph. That was the physics world of that time. Almost all of them were remarkably outstanding. Uh, this was a golden age for physics. Um, did it really get better when, after Sputnik, we, we worked very hard in the U.S. to increase the numbers of people in science? Uh, I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think so either. I think it got much worse. I think it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it, it's the difference between a free market system wherein these scientists are out there putting their ideas out there and having to win the their you know having to earn their keep by proving their value to other scientists and to students and to industry at large you know here here's a here's how i can help you make better airplanes here's how i can help you uh, build better engines here's what we know about fluid dynamics that will make your engines go faster in that kind of world you're, you know, think about it like in, in, in athletics, if you're constantly putting athletes up against each other in a competitive environment, they excel, they get better. On the other hand, if you have athletes that are not competing in terms of athletic performance, or in other words, scientists that are not competing in terms of actually making useful scientific contributions to their field, but you're producing an enormous amount of funding from up above, you're just going to cause an overproduction of the quantity with a collapse in the quality. And it's just central planning as happens everywhere. You know, it's, a, it's think about it like uh, what happens when the government handles the potato industry in the Soviet Union? Well, either you're going to get a shortage of potatoes or you're going to get a flood and surplus of potatoes. But in either case, it's going to be not optimal for the people involved. It could be catastrophic. It could lead to a famine. And I think that's what's happened with science. And I discussed this in the Fiat Standard in my book. Uh, the metric, once you've removed the free market aspect of it, once the scientists and the universities are no longer funded by voluntary contributions of students and industry, then you've removed the competition that forces them to become better. And you flooded them with money. So what they're going to do is they now need to optimize for the metrics that get them more money. And this is, this is basically the um, Austrian school of economics. I don't know if you're familiar with Ludwig von Mises. Yeah. And, yeah, the libertarian. Their Even critique. Schumpeter. Yeah, and Schumpeter, yeah. Their critique, uh, Schumpeter was at MIT as well, where you were. 
um, the the critique of socialist central planning is that the only way that we can coordinate economic production, the only way that we can have sophisticated uh, uh, markets is through people carrying out economic calculation using market prices. So the entrepreneur that needs to figure out how to bake bread, they look at the prices of the inputs and they look at the prices of the outputs and they try and figure out only with prices can they figure out how to best make the decisions for how to make your bread and how to sell your bread. You take away the prices and you make, uh, you nationalize the bread industry. So you take away the prices from the bread industry. And then it doesn't matter how well intentioned the um, central planners are, they are groping in the dark. Without prices, they can't perform calculation. And that's Mises' critique. Who He wrote this in a book called Socialism 100 years ago, 1922. And it was the absolute kill shot for socialism, and it's why socialism really fell apart. It doesn't matter how smart, how intelligent, how many computers, and how well-intentioned um, you have as a central planner. If you own, if the government and the central planner own all of the supply chain, if they own all of the inputs into the bakery and they own all of the outputs and they get to decide who gets the output, you don't have prices. So you don't have a rational way of calculating how to produce the bread most efficiently because there's no market to show you the different opportunity costs of different decisions. And so as soon as this happens, you know, you can go by previous past decisions and previous past prices, but then eventually that's going to break down. And that's why economic production breaks down everywhere. And I think it's the same thing that has happened with scientific production. How does the uh, NIH and the NSF and all of these government financing boards, how do they decide which scientists should get money? Even assuming all the best intentions, even assuming all of the, uh, the smartest people are and, and uh, all, all of the most uh, honest people and the smartest people are in charge of those things, without a free market in the scientific output, there's no way for them to decide what deserves money or not. So what do they do? They go by metrics and these metrics are publications. So what has resulted from this, and I discussed this in the fiat standard, is that you've created a system where everybody's incentives are to produce more publications and we have an avalanche of publications. I mean, it's it's impossible for anybody in any field to even just keep up with the cursory readings of all the journals in a single field. Like uh, I know in economics, there's thousands of journals being published every year. I would not have time to sleep and eat if I decided that I wanted to read all of these and I probably wouldn't even finish them even if I give up on sleep and food. It's so enormous, nobody keeps up with it. So it's just an enormous output of papers, oh. but the incentives are there because um, the funders, they wanna see you publish in order to give you um, research and they're always looking to give more funding to the people who published more. On the other oh. hand, the uh, academics, they have an incentive to publish more. And the universities, they have an incentive to publish more because they want to go up in the rankings. So the result is everybody overproduces in the papers, but then these papers are unreadable. Well, <laughs> it's, it's worse than that, I think, in some <laughs> ways. Uh, you know, not only are the journals pro proliferating, but the distractions are proliferating. I mean, when I was starting my career, we didn't have email. I now start out the day with 400 emails to delete or answer or do something with. Uh, so that gets in the way. Yeah, there is proliferation. Peer review is another sort of joke. It is enforcing conformity. Uh, the public is told it's certification of correctness. That, that's impossible. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Uh, the quarterly journal of the Royal Meteorological Society years ago had some very good instructions for reviewers. And that the instructions were the following, that there were only two bases for rejecting a paper. One was an overt mathematical error, and the second was lack of originality. And otherwise, the paper could not be rejected. Instead, 
the paper would be read at the monthly meeting of the Royal Meteorological Society, and the comments of two experts, quote, would be included with the paper. And so you had the paper and some other people's take on it, and you could make what you wished of it. Now, uh, it also should be recalled that uh, peer review is not ancient. It is largely a post-World War II phenomenon. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think it's uh, it's very interesting where <laughs> to tell people, but you know, uh, Isaac Newton and all the greatest scientists that have ever lived never published in peer-reviewed journals. <laughs> all the most important scientific discoveries came from people who were peer-reviewed. <laughs> yeah. Well, only one German journal, I forget, was it Zeitschrift or something in physics had review, but that was reviewed by the editor who was Max Planck. Uh, yeah. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> I mean, he's he's kind of earned uh, <laughs> that yeah. with his contributions. I mean, I think the concept, obviously, uh, you know, um, e newspapers have peer review of a sort. There's an editor who's going to read your paper and he's going to reject it and he's going to tell you. you know, obviously, the, you're putting out something um, as a publisher and you want to have your name behind it. So there is the, there has to be some form of review. Um, I think what's the problem is that um, because again, these journals are no longer uh, uh, are no longer out there competing in the real world for people's attention. They don't have an incentive to um, improve the quality of what they publish. Their incentive is to um, just churn out as much papers as possible. And in fact, you know, from this dynamic that I was describing earlier, the professors want to publish, the universities want more publishing, and the funding bodies want to show more publications. So the end result of this dance and the real winner from this is the academic publication industry, which really is a cartel. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a truly, uh, <laughs> truly horrible institution that has captured the fruits of the labor of thousands of intelligent people who are just basically slaving away for free. You look all over the world, all these scientists are working for these academic publications and these journals, they make enormous amounts of money. You know, these companies make enormous amounts of money from these journals because they get the scientists and the academics working for them for free. And then they sell the same universities where those scientists and academics work. They sell them those journals for enormous, exorbitant, absurd, criminal <laughs> amounts of money. I mean, MIT pays you a salary and then you go and you write for the journal and then you go and you review for the journal. And then that journal, in order to send these pieces of paper to the MIT uh, library, they'll charge them thousands and thousands of dollars for these pieces of paper. When all that the journal did was just basically have a secretary coordinate between different professors who work at MIT and all these other universities, which then have to turn around and pay these exorbitant amounts of money because the journals have captured the economic calculation problem that I had mentioned earlier. So the financing of the journals comes, the financing of the academics comes from up above, and then it ends up in the academic journal industry because the academic journal industry um, you know, if you want to get promoted, you need to get into the good journals. And also, if your university wants to get a good ranking, it needs to have access to all the best journals. So basically, the academics, uh, the, the bureaucrats at the universities have ended up selling out the universities, selling out the students and the professors to the benefit of the academic publishing industry, which is a truly, truly abhorrent industry. If you look at it this way, they make billions of dollars in profit over what? Well, actually, our library is beginning to drop journals. They can't afford it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's MIT. Yeah. Yeah, and of course, nobody even has needs any access for it. Um, and, and, you know, the, it, it's absurd. That if you want to buy an article from an academic journal, you pay $40 to have one-time access. It's insane. It doesn't cost the journal anything. They're just putting up a PDF. They do some editing, and they put up the PDF. And, you know, all of the... All of the work is done by essentially academic slave labor. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, with publishing, I had a uh, book 
uh, Dynamics and Atmospheric Physics. Cambridge University uh, published it. Now, they asked for a uh, tech file. This is a kind of scientific word processing file. So I sent them that. And a few years later, I wanted to revise the text. And they said they couldn't do it. And I, I said, why? I mean, you know, you have the tech file. I can send you a new one. They said what they did was photocopy the tech file and use photo offset to print it. And therefore, they couldn't modify it. I mean, <laughs> no, I mean That's technology... Was used entirely inappropriately. <laughs> yeah, and like you know, forty years ago, you could sort of tell, you could kind of strain and make a case for why these journals had to be expensive because they print them on fancy paper and then they'd send them to the universities, maybe. But then over the past forty years, printing just got cheaper, and then the internet came along, and now it's basically the marginal cost is close to zero for them to take the file yeah. and convert it to a digital file and then let MIT have it. But their prices just continue to go up and they still don't pay the writers and the editors and they continue to make billions and billions of dollars out of it. And it's the only way that you can get a career in academia. And it's why, you know, it's, it's a big part of the reason why I left academia and why I've published, I've self-published my second book after I left academia. Now I have my own publishing imprint. I publish my own books and I sell directly to my readers. And it's, uh, I sleep much better at night knowing that academic publishers aren't making money uh, from my slave labor. <laughs> well, hopefully you get paid. I do, thankfully enough, you know, more <laughs> more than I did as a university professor, which is what really matters, um, because I don't work for free anymore. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, uh, I wonder, I haven't studied it in detail, but I suspect the spread in salary between professors and administrators has probably grown pretty appreciably <laughs> over time. Yes, it, and it's absurd uh, because uh, you know the the, the uh, if you look at a university today, you know the professors have to work harder and harder to get published in increasingly arcane journals that nobody reads, and it's just a life of really hard work. Whereas if you're an academic and you just um, decide, you know what, screw all of this physics or math or nutrition or economics nonsense, I'm going to go into administration. It's maybe 10% of the work and then five times the pay. <laughs> it's, it's absurd. Well, incentives work, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, they, <laughs> wor they work <laughs> not for what they're advertised to do. I mean, it's, I think it's a massively, massively corrupt system. And um, the reason why I think Bitcoin is so important and so interesting is because it solves all of these problems at the root. And the root cause of these problems comes back to the issue of the fact that some people, we live in a world in which most of us have to work for our money. Most of us have to get out of bed in the morning and slave away in order to make enough money to feed ourselves. But there's a small group of people, government and all of their associated institutions, who don't have to work for their money. And so the laws of economics don't apply to them. It's almost like they, it's like a, group of people that get to opt out of gravity and then they can just fly around everywhere and do whatever they want. They're uh, separated from economic reality. And so, um, you know, we have this massive amount of administrators, the massive amount of academic journals, all of these people are making an enormous amount of money without having to work hard, without having to provide any value for others because they've managed to position themselves in the right place to benefit from the money printing under a bunch of false pretenses about, oh, well, we need finance science so that we get more and better science, or we need to have uh, ad, ad, ad journals, publications uh, that are of a high quality. So I'm going to, you know, uh, we, our journal is going to be the one that does this. And then they end up just basically making money without having to work. And it's at the expense of the students who get into lifelong debt for exorbitant amounts of money to learn from professors that are getting into essentially a lot of hard work to produce things that don't um, matter to the vast majority of people. I think another sad aspect of this is the vast majority of professors don't even care about teaching anymore. It doesn't matter how good you are at teaching because 
uh, it doesn't matter if the students learn or not. What matters is can you get us published? Can you get the university listed in the top publications uh, in your field? And so professors are heavily incentivized not to care about their teaching. I remember um, when I was at university, one of our best professors in teaching, he was so good at the teaching part of his job and he gave such detailed notes and every, all the students loved him, but it came at the expense of publications and he didn't get tenure and he had to leave the university. And it's a very, very common story. Um, the universities aren't optimized for teaching and for the student experience, they're optimized for getting research grants. Well, you know, at the graduate level, I'm not sure the picture should be that way. I mean, graduate school in some ways is very traditional, sort of, uh, you know, you have people uh, working as graduate students learning in order to work in a field rather than to simply learn about it. And so it, it's a more traditional sort of uh, mentoring than undergraduate studies where, uh, you know, it's hard to tell. I mean, how you relate science, for instance, which involves doing things uh, with the humanities, uh, where it's learning about things, developing expertise, but it's a very different world. And then, you know, you have courses for undergraduates that are essentially appreciation courses, how to appreciate literature, how to appreciate poetry, how to appreciate art. Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, clearly those things are not, I would say, essential roles for a university. People can do it on their own. Uh, so. I don't know where we go on that. I mean, universities are primarily credentialing organizations. And uh, they say HR departments, the work of evaluating things, they just look at your credentials. But uh, I think we probably agree this system is not likely to perform well. And the question is, uh, when do you pay the piper? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think um, I think I think the reality is the system is uh, not sustainable already for the majority of people involved. Um, like, uh, particularly, you know, most people have resigned themselves to the fact that all right, I'm not going to university to learn; I'm going to university to get the credentials. But credentials are becoming less and less important in today's world. You can learn anything online and employers are becoming more and more concerned about actual skills rather than credentials. So would you rather get the graphic designer who spent four years at a university paying, getting into $200,000 of debt in order to learn graphic design? Or would you just test somebody based on their portfolio that they have up on their website where they've not gone to university and they spent those four years actually working in graphic design meeting the needs of clients like you. So that gives them specific experience that you're looking for. More and more, it's becoming for it's becoming um, clear to employees that, you know, the, with the internet and with the ability of people to learn everything online, you can look for the actual skills that you want and save yourself and the student uh, a lot of money. In fact, many people tell me that going to university for them as an employer is a negative mark. Like you, you spent $250,000 on learning to do graphic design when you could have done it online uh, for free. Uh, all of the courses are available online. All the material is online. So I think it's not working out well for many students who get into a lot of debt over these things. It's not working out well for a lot of professors. Um, but it's 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 the mental prison that changed them to this thing. Like, no, you know, you grow up thinking you want to go to Harvard and MIT, and so you spend your life working for that. And then once you've got your PhD, and then you want to go into MIT and you want to teach there. And a lot of these people break out of this at some point. You know, they leave their academic jobs and they go and work in the real world where they have an actual productive job, and they feel much happier and much more satisfied. It certainly was the example for me. But you know. It wasn't always that way. In the 50s, um, I worked summers as a technician 
at the Radio Corporation of America, which is one time no longer exists, but one time dominated consumer electronics in the US. And at that time, uh, a very significant portion of the engineers did not become engineers through a degree at an engineering school. They had worked their way up to engineer from technician. And that has virtually disappeared. I think it's it, it, it's uh, it's very common today in uh, online. It's it's very common online. It's, I think it's rather the norm. Like if you look at um, the majority of startup founders, um, yeah, dropouts, dropouts, or not even went to college. And many yeah. of them just learned to code on their own, and then they learned those skills. And I think it's uh, the the free market is emerging much more online because it's just much harder to have government controls and distortions online because information is very easy to travel around online. And that's part you of the reason. Away. With social media, what you're saying is correct. I mean, I think so. I, th I think it is. I think, you know, um, for instance, uh, one example is Bitcoin. Another example is nutrition. Uh, so for many, many years, uh, universities, uh, particularly Harvard, have told the world that you know you need to eat a, a balanced diet that includes all kinds of different toxic uh, <laughs> poisonous things that are not good for you and uh, you look online now you look at the world of um, fitness influencers online they are giving people advice that is in direct contradiction to that no you should not be eating six to ten portions of grains every day no you should not worry about eating animal saturated fats you're actually better off eating animal fat than you are eating um, sugars and starches you need to reduce your sugar, sugars and starches and you need to get animal protein and animal fat and this is i'm, I'm oversimplifying here but uh, you know there's thousands of different diets and thousands of different um, influencers online that are telling people all kinds of different variations on this one general message, which is basically, <laughs> don't listen to Harvard. Harvard is out there to poison you to benefit their sponsors, and it works. And a lot more people uh, are, you know, improving their health. They're uh, getting much better. They're getting fitter. They're uh, reversing some uh, supposedly irreversible medical conditions uh, by following this stuff. The internet is allowing for people to do that, and I think a lot of the uh, a lot of the kind of hate that the internet gets about uh, this is essentially um, the credential guilds being upset about the fact that people aren't listening to them anymore. Yeah, people don't care if you have a PhD in nutrition from Harvard anymore. A lot less people care today than they did 30 years ago because a lot more people have managed to uh, change their lives. You know, you know diabetics who, who are no longer on diabetes medication because they stopped eating sugars and grains. It's such an insanely simple idea, but yeah, if diabetes is a problem of glucose metabolism if you stop metab if you can't metabolize glucose maybe don't eat all the foods that are full of glucose I mean, it sounds so uh, outlandish but it's not something that they teach you at Harvard because they're sponsored by the glucose manufacturers and they're sponsored by the insulin manufacturers and so they're out there telling you yeah no just have a balanced diet that includes all kinds of different insulin spiking things so that you can keep all of our sponsors happy so that's destroyed the credibility of a lot of these uh, scientific institutions and i think it's a good thing uh, sure not everybody online is uh, giving away good advice but i think many more people are uh, giving good advice online because online you know you live and die by the results of your um, uh, advice you know if you go out there and you tell people to eat something that makes them sick uh, they're not going to come back and post testimonials saying, hey, this guy uh, improved my life. They're going to say, this guy told me to eat like this and now I feel terrible. Hopefully. <laughs> All right. So I wanted to ask you about the IPCC. This is an important yeah. topic. So you've worked at the IPCC. You published, you were the lead author of the chapter on physical climate processes and feedbacks which was in the third assessment report that was published in 2001. And at that point, uh, you know, it was a, I, I would say it was probably a, a little bit different from what it is right now. They had people like you on board. Well, you know, initially, and I think subsequently, uh, governments uh, used to ask people 
to participate. You know, they tried to get as many people as they could to participate. I don't think in selecting people for the working groups, that's something you have to understand a little. The IPCC has three working groups. One is science, one is uh, impacts, one is mitigation. Only one deals with science. All three groups consist, quote, in experts in these areas. And uh, they write these unintelligible reports, uh, thousand pages, no index. Um, the review is perfunctory. Uh, you know, you get reviews, you, they get read to you, and you're asked, do you want to accept it or not? And you say no, and they throw it away. <laughs> so it's not a real review. But on the other hand, uh, people don't want to say anything totally stupid in the, review, in the working group reports. So, for instance, working group one on the science You'll never see them uh, say it's an existential threat. I mean, they'll come out with a, a scenario and uh, say, you know, this might reduce GDP by 3% in uh, 50 years, when, assuming that uh, GDP has increased 300% by then and so on. So none of this sounds very ominous. The section, each of us was responsible for only about three pages of these thousands. And I remember I was working with two colleagues. Uh, we differed on things, but we came to an agreement that however biased it might be, we, we wouldn't write anything that was overtly wrong. It's a pretty, how should, limited <laughs> restriction. But nevertheless, you know, writing on the feedbacks and so on, it was openly acknowledged we didn't know how to do it. Uh, that uh, we had the models did know, could not handle clouds. They couldn't handle all sorts of things that were vital. There was nothing I felt ashamed of on it. Uh, there was a kind of monitor who came around and said, you know, why aren't you making it more ominous. And uh, I remember one of the people who was working with me, who was an ardent greenie, broke into tears and said, you know, how, how dare you accuse me of not being an enthusiast for this. Uh, but, you know, all three of us decided we would never participate again. And so each subsequent uh, IPCC report has more and more trouble finding anyone who will participate. And of course, the quality decreases, but it doesn't much matter because, uh, you know, you have this funny procedure. You have this thousand page report, it's unreadable. And then you have a summary for policymakers. The summary for policymakers is not written by the authors. You, you have, should backtrack a little. The people who participate in it are chosen by a scientific unit, quote, which is, was at that time located in the UK Met Office. But there is a coordinating lead author who is, uh, mon you know, moderating the whole procedure. He's chosen by the political unit. And so at the end, the summary for policymakers does have the coordinating lead authors from each of the chapters, plus a much larger group of government officials. They then decide on a summary. And the summary comes out six months before the report in order to allow the differences in the summaries to be reflected in the report. That is to say, if the summary is inconsistent with the first version of the report, they want to have time to change the science. <laughs> uh, but that, that's the first step. And it goes on. And, you know, the summary for policymakers might be 20 pages, but I think they understand nobody reads 20 pages even. Certainly nobody reads a thousand pages. 
So it eventually ends up that you have a uh, press release that comes out with an iconic statement. Now it happens for the third report and subsequent reports. The iconic statement is something like, uh, we are now 90% sure that most of the warming in the last 50 years is due to man's activities. This statement might be totally bogus, but the interesting thing about it is it's also perfectly innocuous because even if it were true, it doesn't imply a big problem because, you know, it hasn't warmed much. And so everyone has sort of covered their rear end because, uh, you know, for instance, with that statement, which meant nothing, uh, you had Senators Lieberman and McCain respond that now we have the smoking gun and we must do something. And so at each stage, it's like a game of telephone or something else. And the message gets amplified and amplified. And eventually, uh, it sounds serious. Uh, but, you know, the, the impact is to increase funding. So the scientists don't complain. Uh, they've covered themselves. They haven't said anything bad. It's not them who said it. And so you have this peculiar chain of uh, amplification, which eventually bears no relation to the original science. Yeah, and I think the bait and switch here is that they've they use these kind of fantastic claims that arrive in this um, executive summary reports, but they want them to have the same veneer of science that of course, is, of course, yeah, and that's uh, it, it, that's what's kind of very frustrating about talking to a lot of the climate. Um, uh, faithful, really, the, the the crisis faithful, the people who think that we really are in a climate crisis is, look, all of these scientists agree. Well, no, all of these scientists were told to write a report and they got paid well to do it and then they wrote the report. No, and then, actually, nobody gets paid. Well, yeah, but I mean, they, they get paid to get, if you get into that report, it helps you keep your job and it, uh, it it's good for your tenure and it's good for your, uh, you have to be published in these kind of things in order to keep your academic job. That's maybe, the kind of incentive they maybe. have. I, I think there's actually something else going on. You, you're partly right. I mean, remember, this was a very small field in a sense. Uh, nobody was calling themselves climate scientists. And yet at the end of the day, you, you speak of the IPCC as thousands of the world's leading climate scientists. And suddenly it's a big field. What happens is it's a UN organization. So you have to have scientists, quote, from every place, from Zimbabwe, from Kenya, from Sri Lanka, from this, from there. For most of them, uh, you know, they really are not professionally active, but it sounds great back home that they are now considered among the world's thousands of leading scientists. And so they benefit reputationally from it. I don't think that's true in the States. I don't think anyone's reputation increases with it. But I think uh, I, I think it's very true. I've seen a lot of people brag about the fact that, oh, my advisor is on the IPCC. and uh, Oh, yeah. And we, all, we all were listed as uh, contributing to the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> the yes. I, I even have my certificate for that. <laughs> yeah, so there's, there's quite a bit of prestige that comes with that. Yeah, it's it's possible in the public domain. I, I I certainly don't think it's true in academia, or at least not at MIT. Nobody really uh, gets plaudits for serving on the IPCC. Okay, I mean, I, I remember in Colombia it was uh, it was a pretty big deal. People were pretty proud uh, of it. But I guess when were you at Colombia because they have that climate center which yeah. is pretty bizarre. I was there 2004 to 2009. Yeah, so it was already there. The Earth Institute? Right. 
Yeah, that's uh, that's where I got uh, my PhD. It was joint between the Earth Institute and the uh, School of International Public Affairs. One thing I'll tell you is, um, I when I was there, I was a card carrying member of the uh, Climate Hysteria <laughs> Association, and I, one thing that I remember is your name always came up as this kind of uh, oddball, uh, awkward <laughs> uncle that. Uh, annoyed people and it was always you know all the science degree except for this one guy in mit who was you know they couldn't just dismiss you entirely because you had impeccable credentials and so if they said well this guy is from mit and he's uh he's just a crank well then that puts into question all of the credentials that all the rest of these guys have so well how can you you know if it, how, how can you at once say, listen to the authorities and listen to the science and listen was to the, Who was the head of the Earth Institute? What was his name? He was an economist. Yep, Jeffrey Sachs. Jeffrey Sachs. I remember him. <laughs> I'm over he, Yeah, he, he was uh, the one who would always mention you as, I ah, haven't done this guy at MIT. And I, I didn't give much thought to it at that time because, you know, obviously, oh, well, so just one guy at MIT, who cares? But then, uh, you know, and then I uh, started thinking more critically and that I came across your work. You've tried your best no matter what happens. You know, I hope uh, one favor I'd ask, uh, you know, I mentioned a paper that uh, I was suggesting people look at. And a problem I have with that is trying to explain how the system works. And uh, it's true. I mean, it's taken, you know, professors and grad students and so on decades to get these notions straight. And uh, very much dynamic meteorology is a work in progress. And so it's not surprising to me that people can't absorb it very readily. But if anyone reads it and can suggest how to make it more communicable. I would love to hear from them. Absolutely. Which, which paper is that? This is the one that the Global Warming Policy Foundation put out. You know, I gave you the link. Yeah, the, two, the two, 2018 uh, transcript. No, no it's uh, very recent. It's the 20- one you submitted to the SEC? No. No, the SEC thing is... You see, with the SEC uh, amicus brief, mm-hmm. the problem we dealt with, we recognize there's no one there who is going to understand the science. And so we emphasize the fact that the information they were working with was not derived on the basis of science. And, you know, that was the emphasis there. But the science itself gets left out. Yeah. Uh, I gave you a link to something at the Global Warming Policy Foundation. Yeah, the other one you sent me that was in 2022 from uh, right. an assessment of the conventional global warming. Right, United. exactly. There's a comment by Nick Lewis. Yeah, yeah. We'll post that definitely. Post that. And if anyone could suggest how to clarify that, uh, I'd appreciate that because – I find that a very difficult concept to explain. Uh, there are two figures I may have sent you that helpful. I mean, the idea here is the extra tropics, outside the tropics, determines the equator to pole temperature difference. Mm-hmm. The one-dimensional picture plays a role in what determines the tropical temperature. But the IPCC and the common narrative say the tropics control the whole thing. And that is not true. And as a result, the greenhouse picture is not the picture of how climate works. And um, communicating that to anyone except someone who's been working on it, and there are a few, uh, has been a very difficult issue. Now, I don't know if it would help at this stage because, uh, you know, when you're indoctrinating children, you're not counting on the science. But uh, it would pay if more people understood how the system worked. Yeah, I think uh, I, I I hope a lot of my listeners will uh, look into it and um, 
contact me and I'll be happy to pass any of the feedback uh, over Great. to you. Or do you have your email uh, available in public so they can contact you directly? Sure. For better okay. or for worse, it's just MIT always ha you know, has it available. So it's R-L-I-N-D-Z-E-N, R-L-I-N-Z in one word, at MIT.edu. Yes. So I'll tell you this. Um, basically, uh, my listeners are predominantly people who are into Bitcoin. And if you're into Bitcoin, then you've already gone through one kind of uh, uh, ego death where you had to come to terms with the fact that uh, things that you learned at school and university are nonsense. And so Bitcoiners have this very um, strong knack for what we call trust, uh, verify, don't trust. Um, because uh, the way that Bitcoin works is that it's a system built by paranoid people for paranoid people, wherein you don't have to trust anybody for anything. So the way Bitcoin uh, works is... It does your book explain blockchain technology? Yes, that's basically it. Blockchain technology is uh, is a word that people don't really who don't really understand Bitcoin use to explain what's going on. It's kind of like calling cars um, fuel injection technology. It's it's a part of what makes the car function. But the important thing about it is that it's an automobile. It's a car. It's a thing you get into and it moves you from A to B. So uh, the important thing that blockchain technology does is Bitcoin and all the other digital currencies, in my opinion, and all the other applications for blockchain, in my opinion, and in the opinion of most uh, hardcore Bitcoiners are essentially a distraction. Um, they're a little bit like, uh, you know, so we've invented the car and there's these people that are telling us, oh, we can use the car to make horse carriages more comfortable. So they're uh, putting an engine on a horse carriage and tying the, or, or tying horses to cars and thinking that that's going to be an improvement. And what we're trying to say is, no, the, the whole point of this thing is to get rid of the horse. In other words, the whole point of this thing is to get rid of having a central authority controlling the money. So in order to make it, uh, the point I'm trying to get to is that in order to make it to um, <laughs> our level of Bitcoin, you've already gone through a process of questioning a lot of beliefs and analyzing them from the beginning. So maybe there isn't a single group of people anywhere in the world that is as less trusting of authority as Bitcoiners, and they'll just verify anything rather than trust it. So that's why, you know, the thing that I was mentioning about diet is pretty heretic for pretty much anybody outside of Bitcoin. But within Bitcoin, this has become basically common knowledge. Everybody understands that, yeah, um, Harvard <laughs> nutrition is uh, garbage and um, they tell you nonsense because, you know, people study these things, people experiment on their own. So I think hopefully we're going to get some people who are willing to look into this and study it in detail and uh, give you good feedback on it uh, this is this is i believe how we're going to revitalize these corrupt institutions of science um, it's going to have to happen from a kernel of bitcoin really because uh it's going to have to come from a place where that is independent of uh, government money and government financing because government money is uh comes with a preset agenda and a preset conclusion as we discussed earlier and bitcoiners are developing the freedom to be able to operate outside of that system and to be able to uh, analyze things without having to um, trust authority so i hope many of my listeners will go through this paper which will post the link to in my uh, in the show notes and always the show notes are on safetydean.com slash podcast you'll find the episode and then you'll find all the show notes there okay great excellent look forward to it thank you thank you do any of the attendees have questions for professor Lindzen? yeah please go ahead nathan yeah sir uh very enjoyable thank you much i have recently uh seen the claim that oil is not a fossil-based uh, occurrence. And I've, I chase that around and the arguments, uh, they seem reasonable on the surface, but I haven't really, uh, I don't have an opinion on that. I wondered if you uh, had any comment on that claim. The answer is no. Uh, that's something I have no expertise in. Tommy Gold, who I, I admired greatly, was pushing this many years ago, that uh, there are other possibilities for natural gas and oil. 
in the earth? I, I don't know. I mean, uh, I'm not sure. I mean, his point was it may be that our estimates of the amount available were greatly understated. And that would have some implications, but I have no assessment of it. Thanks. Yeah, it's one thing that's also fascinating me. I'm beginning to look at the Tommy Gold's work. I think it's pretty compelling. I think the, the evidence that they muster on this is is quite strong because there's uh, there's a, there, there's a lot of oil out there. It's difficult to imagine that it's all uh, being produced. Uh, from dinosaurs. From dinosaurs, yeah. That's a lot of dinosaurs. We just keep <laughs> burning through them. And also, there's uh, there are fossil fuels in meteors and in other planets. So it's it's quite... Yeah. Um, no, Tommy Gold was a very bright and imaginative guy. I knew him. and uh, He taught at Harvard briefly and then moved on to Cornell. And... Uh, had a number of protégés who, however, uh, did not follow him in his adventurousness. Yeah. Do you know any of his, uh, uh, any people who would uh, today defend that proposition? I'd like to discuss this in more detail I, with them. I don't know. Um, I was a high school classmate of one of his protégés, Peter Goldreich, mm -hmm. but I don't think Peter ever ultimately agreed with Tommy. I see. It's a fascinating question that I find really interesting. Yeah, I mean, it has implications, but, you know, even for the people who regard it as purely a fossil fuel, the amount available is huge. All these policies are designed to waste a plentiful resource. <laughs> Yeah, I think, yeah, I think I agree. And I think it's, it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, whether you, whatever you think of the origin of it, I think it's just, uh, it's very obvious that it just keeps getting cheaper in real terms. We keep finding more and the reserves continue to grow. Our proven reserves of oil just grow every year. We're yeah. not draining a limited resource. But that's by definition, you know, proven reserves is uh, very fungible. I mean, it doesn't mean quite what it says. Yeah, the, the more we look, the more we prove. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. All right, uh, Dr. Lindsden, is there, uh, uh, tell, tell us more about uh, where people can find you and uh, your work online. So you mentioned this paper, which we'll post. Anything else uh, you'd like to mention? Yeah, there are a few items in the website of the CO2 Coalition. Mm -hmm. And uh, other than that, I have no specific web presence. Uh, Why don't you join Twitter? It's a lot of fun. Uh, how shall I put it? it uh, the internet occupies too much of my time already. There's an age issue also. I find my contemporaries avoid social media like the plague. The whole notion of social media seems strange to us. Yeah, but I think you might want to consider Twitter. Twitter is, uh, I love Twitter because it's its not social media in the sense where you go and hang out with your friends and keep up with uh, your cousin's uh, children and what they're doing. Um, it's a place where you just exchange ideas and you boil ideas down to uh, 280 characters. So <laughs> you have to, the best thing about it is that you have to get to the point. And so people who just waffle on and make uh, endless noises rather than getting to the point, they can't you, uh, thrive in you Twitter. You know the old statement, uh, <laughs> I didn't have time to reduce this, so you have to accept the longer version. <laughs> yeah. That's that. That's what Twitter is. It's actually, I would say, Twitter has made me a much better writer because it's forced me to uh, really, and and that's the hardest thing in writing. It's just get your idea down to the uh, core that you want to communicate, and Twitter is, is excellent for that. And it's also it's a great place for you to get ideas out and get feedback on them um, because you can just simply ignore anybody who's wasting your time. You can block anybody who's uh, bothering you, and you can interact only with the people that you find interesting. But, you know, I, I was thinking of a, a friend of mine, a mathematician, Sergio Klenerman. He's a professor at Princeton. 
very distinguished, uh, you know, a, uh, field prize medalist and so on, which is the Nobel Prize in mathematics, essentially. And he recently published a proof of uh, an important theorem. The proof took 800 pages. What would it mean for him to condense it into 280 some odd characters? No, he wouldn't condense it into 280 characters. He'd write in one sentence, he'd say, I've I've come up with the proof of X, and then he just posts a link to the 800 pages. And then, and then the people who are assessing it, they're not going to read the 800-page proof. What well, they comment? well, the thing is, like, all the people, I mean, you're going to get more people assessing it if you're posting it on Twitter. You're going to reach many more mathematicians than if uh, whatever, whatever form. Absolutely. There's 300 million people on Twitter. I'm sure many of them are mathematicians. There are mathematicians on Twitter. There's Twitter math and there are people doing problems and discussing really? proofs. And, you know, obviously you don't have to uh, put all the discussion in the tweet because you just put a link to the tweet. So you can put a link to this paper. People will read it and then they'll give you feedback maybe in 280 characters or maybe they'll write a blog post about it. But it, uh, it, it amplifies your reach massively. And in, the, in your case, with the topic of climate, you're going to find a much, much bigger audience, I would say, than mathematicians, because this is something that's becoming very topical now. And I think the current er energy crisis in Europe and, you know, the grid failures in California and Texas, they're really making people question this. Up until a few years ago, you know, in polite society, you wouldn't question these things. You, even if you had your doubts about it, you know, and you wanted to be invited to the right dinner party, so you wouldn't make any noises about it. But I think people are now realizing, no, you know what? I like 24-hour electricity more than I like impressing uh, <laughs> idiots. And so I'm going to start questioning this, and I'm going to start uh, asking questions, and I'm going to be public about it. So you'll find a much bigger audience, I think, if you go on Twitter for this. Oh, thank God, it. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Excellent. You, you'll be a big, big, big prize if uh, you land on Twitter. I tell you, a lot of people will be happy about it. Okay. A lot of people will be upset, actually. That's the real selling point. You're going to upset a lot of people if you join Twitter. The right people to upset. <laughs> okay. I manage that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but amplify it. <laughs> well, anyway. Professor Lindsay, thank you so much for joining us. This has been a pleasure and an honor. And thank you so much for everything that you do. It's 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 truly heartening and encouraging to see people like you, um, where you could very easily uh, just go along with the tide, but uh, you stick your neck out in spite of all of the um, antagonism that you get. Thank you. Yes, I should mention one thing if you have the moment. As you sure. say, it's not live. I'm a theoretician, and, and that is, it sounds slightly irrelevant, but it means I never had a great deal of need for money, uh, especially when personal computers became powerful and cheap. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, I could do the calculations, I could do the things with minimal assistance, I needed money to pay grad students. That's the way it was at MIT. Uh, but one of the things that has changed, theory used to be the center of studies of atmospheric physics and so on. Uh, it was the way of taking a complicated system, breaking it into components in a rational way and understanding them in an analytic fashion. And so this was the heart of progress in meteorology from, I would say, 1914 through 1990. And it was always the hardest course that students took. And now it's been completely supplanted by modeling which is much easier. The students take someone else's model, they run it and treat it as though it were data. And that absence of a theoretical structure in the field is really damaging. It meant there's no conceptual framework any longer other than the narrative that is presented that you know, allows an Al Gore to show the cycles of ice ages as proof, even though cause follows effect instead of the reverse. 
I mean, one is reduced to that level of misunderstanding. And um, one of the things that is crucial, I think, for progress in the field is a return to developing theory. By theory, I mean simply quantitatively isolating components of the system and uh, using them to work out how it works. Because we can't integrate the full equations. And so things like linearization or order of magnitude analysis played a major role. At any rate, for your people who like to think about such things, it's probably worth doing a little thought on why theory has disappeared from this subject. Yeah, I think it's uh, my my idea is that it's uh, it's much more adaptable. Um, modeling is much more flexible and pliable for arriving at the conclusions that you want. <laughs> also, you don't have to do anything. <laughs> you just run it. Yeah. I find it absolutely amazing how models are treated as if they're science when really it's sock puppetry because you could get a model to say anything that you want. You know, you put in whatever assumptions you want and you can get whatever result you want. And yet media reports them, or media reports on these models yeah. as if they're uh, conclusions. Like the scientists have concluded that in 2050, uh, the, the ice poles are going to melt and we're all going to die. Well, no, you just ran <laughs> a boring version well, of SimCity. The irony is... You know, even the IPCC models don't predict any such things. No, of course. I mean, it's, it's, so it becomes irrelevant what the models say. It's what the, the interpreters say the models say. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Good Thank meeting. you so much. Okay. Thank you. Likewise. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.